Good morning, everyone. I'm Adrian Arsht, Executive Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council and founder of the Adrian Arsht Latin America Center and the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. Colombia is incredibly dear to me. Earlier this month, I was the first person to receive the decoration commemorating the 200 years of diplomatic relations between the Republic of Colombia and the United States. And in 2018, I received the Order of San Carlos in recognition of my commitment to the prosperity of your beautiful country. I wear these medals very proudly. My deep affinity for Colombia is one reason why it is my special pleasure to introduce Minister of Finance and Credit, Jose Manuel Restrepo. An economist by training, Mr. Restrepo was appointed finance minister almost a year ago in May of 2021, at a time of social protest and social instability in the country. Previously, he was minister of commerce, industry, and tourism. Minister Restrepo has been instrumental in Colombia's economic reactivation and tax reform. Under his leadership, Colombia experienced a record real gross domestic product expansion of over 10%. Latin finance ranked Minister Restrepo as Latin America's best minister of finance and credit for 2021 a true statement to the great work he is doing. And perhaps we should get a medal for you. Minister, thank you again for joining us today at this early hour to talk about Colombia. We look forward to hearing your thoughts on your country's economic outlet, outlook and opportunities to further advance us Colombia ties, especially as the conflict in Ukraine reshapes the global order. And now I will turn it over to Jason Marzak, Senior Director of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center, who will moderate the conversation. Jason. Thank you so much, Adrian and Minister Restrepo. It's so great to see you. I, I, although we're virtual and you're in Bogota, and, uh, but I hope the next time we can host you at the Atlantic Council office in Washington, DC. I, I wanna also thank Josh Lipsky, Senior Director of the Geoeconomic Center for co-hosting this program with us. Always great to work with Geoeconomic Center around all these events for IMF World Bank Week. To further frame our conversation, it's important to mention that Colombia's economic recovery from COVID, as Adrian mentioned, has exceeded expectations. Uh, maybe one of the reasons that Mr. Mastrepo received this, this notoriety. The output uh, uh, in 2021 follows a, a record slump in 2020, uh, which was brought on in no smart pop by the pandemic and, and strong, strong commodity prices. Many challenges, of course, lie ahead. One of the challenges is rising inflation, of course, not particular to Colombia itself, but, but a global phenomenon. And importantly, making sure the nation's strong economic recovery, as always, translates for all Colombians. Colombia is also, of course, headed to the polls in a little over a month. And inevitably, the results of this election will have repercussions on Colombia's economy, which we will discuss shortly. And of course, uh, the war in Ukraine and the world's economic response as covered extensively by our Geoeconomic Center is front and center for the spring meetings. With that, Minister, I wanna kick off with a more global question for you. Uh, this year's meetings uh, take place against the, the somber, very somber backdrop of the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, the IMF has stated that the war will severely set back the global economy. How can these institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, how can these issues play an even more important role and supporting a more inclusive, sustainable future for Colombia and Latin American Caribbean, especially taking into account the elevated food and energy prices that the region is suffering. Colombia, among other among other things, is the world's ninth largest importer of corn. Thank you, Jason, and, and first of all, thank you for inviting me to this meeting. I want to express my gratitude and honor for being in this meeting, especially the gratitude to the Atlantic Council and especially to Adrienne Arsh. I think that we appreciate what you have done for Colombia in the past. And let me begin by maybe giving a kind of context about this question. I think that we have confronted the worst economic shock in our history, which was with COVID-19. As you know, COVID-19 left us with 
social scars, social wounds, especially in poverty, social inequality, unemployment. Uh, in a way, we have lost at least eight years in a successful story in, in our country, uh, especially in terms of uh, attaining social goals. So just imagine that after that, now we have another disaster. So now we're in the middle of a nonsense invasion, which by the way, is exacerbating the post-pandemic pandemic, unexpected and dangerous outcomes. A conflict that of course is creating more uncertainty that is producing less international growth, which in my way, in, in, my, in my opinion, it was relevant for, uh, in order to confront the pandemic, which is creating, as you have said, uh, higher reasons for inflation in our countries, especially impacting the most vulnerable people, which is creating more difficulties in the global supply chain, which again is a source for scarcity and for inflation. So I think that given that situation, in my opinion, and maybe that's the answer to your question, we need a new way, a new role, a new leadership in multilateral institutions. And maybe something similar on what Kristalina Georgieva said, building a new Bretton Woods, a new model of Bretton Woods institutions. And I think that that kind of global leadership has to improve the idea. And that's maybe the main point of comprehensive sustainability. Yeah. And Mr. Richard, a, quick, a, a quick fault there, what is, a, a new role, a new way, what does that look like in a way that benefits Colombia and, and benefits regions like Latin America and the Caribbean? Uh, my point, Jason, is that this is the moment in which we need another or maybe a stronger leadership. Let me say something that I think that during the pandemic, we lost a lot because we didn't have that leadership in the world. Just imagine that countries in the world bought six times their population on the COVID vaccine, for example, while the other, other countries didn't have the possibility to have access to that vaccine. Do you find that reasonable? I, I didn't. And I think that that only shows the lack of leadership in the world mm -hmm. by that moment. So this is a moment in which we have to build in a different way. So how this new idea of leadership, of comprehensive sustainability leadership is going to help our countries? Well, because we have to build another kind of macroeconomic policy, more concerned about the most vulnerable, more concerned about the small and medium enterprises in a country like Colombia or Latin American uh, countries, more concerned about informality, more concerned about the needs and the desires of the youngsters in our societies, more concerned about green strategies or green policies. So I think that this is the moment in which we actually need a real leadership in these institutions to help our countries to build uh, as I said, a more comprehensive sustainability macroeconomic model. Thank you, Mr. Ostrap. I'll only turn to, to Colombia specifically. Um, as, as we were talking about earlier, uh, rising inflation, rising food prices globally has, of course, impacts on Colombia. What is your forecast? The IMF, of course, just came out with a revised uh, downward forecast for the global economy. What is your forecast for the Colombian economy this year? And in addition to, or besides the elections next month, what should we be watching out for that may drive the economic direction of Colombia in one way or another? I think that after we have, as I said, confronted the worst economic shock in our history, uh, we had an extraordinary growth last year, 10.6%. And we are expecting this year in our medium term fiscal framework, a growth of at least 5%. But you know, Based on the numbers that we have seen in the first three months of this year, I think that maybe the growth is going to be higher than that. And for example, IMF is saying that. IMF is saying Colombia will grow at least 5.8%. And based also on the what is called the ISE index by the National Statistics Department, uh, we have seen that maybe the first three months will grow between 7 to 8%. And if you have tax collection, which is growing more than 
compared to the last year, I think that now we're going to have an extraordinary number of growth, which by the way is showing that Colombia is now the country with the highest growth rate with the comparable countries in Latin America. Of course, we have challenges. Of course, we do have it. We have the challenge of inflation. We have the challenge of how to reduce poverty. We have the challenge on how to reduce social inequality. Uh, but we are doing that. We are creating more employment. We are developing a more a strong or a stronger social active action and policies in, in Colombia. But of course, uh, we are seeing that the opportunities and the growth that we're expecting for this country is going to be higher than we expected. And as, we're, as you're looking at drivers for that growth, you, you mentioned inflation, you mentioned the importance of focusing on poverty and inequality. Uh, we, we talked about the elections. What are some other drivers that you're looking at uh, for the remainder of this year that will influence the direction of the Colombian economy one, one way or another? We have seen that in 2021, maybe the most important drivers came from industry, commerce, uh, and consumption in a way, talking about the demand. What are we seeing this year? We're seeing this year that in the industry is also growing a lot. Uh, commerce and consumption is growing, but less than that year, than last year. However, we, we are seeing extraordinary numbers in terms of investment, for example. And not only foreign direct investment, we're seeing numbers, interesting numbers on internal investment. I think that there we have uh, an extraordinary source of growth. Why? Well, because we actually apply the counter-cyclical policy. We actually build a quasi new deal program called Compromiso with Colombia, which is investing, for example, on infrastructure. We are seeing record numbers on exports. The best number of exports uh, or the second one in the last seven years. And in terms of non-mining, the best in at least 14 years, especially, for example, taking advantage of uh, the market in the United States. And I think that's relevant for this relationship between the US and Colombia. Now, uh, Mr. Estrepa, you mentioned earlier, uh, couldn't agree more, the OECD has, has also uh, warned of, of inequality, growing inequality and, and, and poverty. And I know this is a, a, a focus of yours and of, of the Colombian government. What is, what's been your, the, your, the government's plan to address the increases in, in poverty and, and inequality that will likely only be exacerbated by some of these global drivers. And, and also, as you're looking ahead, uh, what, do you, what do you see as some of the reforms that are needed uh, in the coming years, uh, even beyond this current government, to support Colombia's continued prosperity and continue to, to drive down uh, that inequality that persists? Remember, Jason, that I approved at the Congress the fiscal reform. We were actually the first country in Latin America which actually approved a fiscal reform. How? Well, by talking to the people, by building empathy with the society and with their needs. But one of the main, uh, maybe the soul of the fiscal reform, and that's why we call it in that way, was the social program. We actually call it uh, social investment law. And, and that was true, actually. Why? Well, because we, we, we thought that we needed to have a response on social aspects in the, in the economy. We, we, we saw that we needed, for example, a stronger cash transfer program. And we have built in the past Ingreso Solidario, which was a cash transfer for 3 million households in Colombia. And we moved from that cash transfer program to a stronger cash transfer to at least 4 million households. But the, the important thing is that, that those kind of programs now in Colombia actually go to at least 10 million households, which means around 29 million people. Why, why are we doing that? Well, because we, we know that we have to, to kind of social programs to actually reduce poverty. On the other side, we included the zero fees on higher education for technical and professional programs in official universities. And that's a way to build the new talent of Colombia and to take advantage, in my opinion, to the most important asset of this country, which is human talent. We also included programs related to small and medium enterprises. For example, to have more access to funding 
to the informal people, to the informal firms of Colombia. So I, I think that we are developing those social programs uh, and, and uh, that's relevant for the future of Colombia. And looking ahead, I think that we have to work on this idea of informality. How are we going to deal with informality? Informality in terms of labor informality, firms informality, financial informality. We have also to work on how to develop the human talent of Colombia, especially in a digital economy. How are we going to strengthen our small and medium enterprise tissue in, in Colombia? How are we going to create more and more employment? I think that that's also quite relevant in, in the next future. Uh, I think that there we have maybe some of the most important issues that we have to, to develop. Mr. Strepo, as you know, the uh, the Atlantic Council, uh, our focus on Colombia is is deep and and, uh, and incredibly committed. And and for a number of years now, our U.S. Colombia Task Force, chaired by Senators uh, Cardin and, and Blunt, have uh, really been driving how to further deepen the partnership uh, between the U.S. and Colombia. You just mentioned key key issues: informality, human talent, SMEs, the need for more employment. What do you see as, as the as greater opportunities for further U.S. Columbia partnership to be able to uh, uh, help to uh, advance some of these different issues? I think this is a moment that in the relationship between U.S. and Colombia, we need maybe new sources of growth and maybe a topic which can be developed more in this relationship in economical terms is how to develop, for example, innovation and entrepreneurship in Colombia. We were, we were seeing actually the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Index, and we saw that Colombia is now number one in Latin America, yeah. 25 in the world. So that means that we have a very interesting human talent to be entrepreneur. Uh, but of course, entrepreneurship needs funding. So let's, let's imagine if we can build something different, something, uh, stronger or something more uh, audacious in, in the way that we, we can build more entrepreneurship in our country. Mm -hmm. and of provide course, through, through innovation and through the relationship between the private sector, the public sector of both countries, including also the academia, universities. I think there we have an opportunity. And mm -hmm. the other opportunity is how to build this idea of sustainable growth. Sustainable growth means how to take advantage of the new green policies of Colombia and how can we build based on those new green policies in our country. And, and all the more important uh, as we look at these global drivers and how these global drivers are impacting not just uh, Colombia, but the region and, and the world. Uh, I want to bring in a, a, a couple uh, uh, questions from some of our, our participants here and First turn to uh, Gene Hoffman, the uh, COO and president of CHIA. Uh, Gene, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Minister, you know, I understand that Colombia will soon be joining Mexico, Costa Rica, Japan, Singapore, Switzerland, and others in trialing the World Bank's climate warehouse on the CHIA blockchain. Uh, what other sorts of things are Colombia looking for for to real use cases of blockchains? And how can we help Colombia become more involved with the technology community. Jin, you know that we have the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution based on the World Economic Forum. And that center is actually working on uh, actually the use of blockchain. But let me give you just one example on the kind of things that we can build together. Why not use blockchain, for example, for example to confront corruption, especially in, in uh, uh, public offerings? Uh, and public, uh, how do you say, public bots, public, uh, well, I mean, the kind of things that are uh, paid uh, by the public sector. I think that there we have an opportunity using blockchain to confront corruption. And that's relevant since uh, as any other countries, we actually face that problem. That's one opportunity. The other opportunity, Jim, I think is also to build uh, or to use blockchain actually in this idea of green growth, sustainable growth, as you have said, uh, in, in the same model as, uh, as the other countries that we were you saying. Today, we have a, like an over-the-counter market for emission certificates. 
But I think that we, we can strengthen that program. And we have actually talked to Goldman Sachs on how to develop this, this uh, market of certificates uh, in, in a country which, by the way, has the projects, the opportunities, um, and the market that we need. Well, we can, we can use this kind of new technologies, uh, like the use of blockchain for that. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me turn now to Deborah Lair, uh, uh, who will ask a question. Deborah is the CE, Chief Executive Officer of Edelman Global Advisory. Deborah. Great. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for your very insightful comments. We really appreciate it. And I want to pick up on one of the themes that you've touched on here now. We're all very appreciative of Colombia's um, leadership in the region when it comes to climate change and biodiversity, and particularly in protection of the Amazon. And just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about what Colombia is doing when it comes to green finance. I know often the biggest challenge in reaching net neutrality is how to pay for it, but it can also be, as you were talking about, a wonderful driver of economic growth and job creation. And certainly Colombia has been a leader when it comes to green finance. So you, could you share a little bit more about how that is part of your strategy? Let, Deborah, let me begin by saying that Colombia has uh, identified and we, have, we are convinced that we need ambition on, on this topic of uh, green growth. That's why President Duque has established some goals for Colombia. 51% of the reduction of greenhouses effects in, in Colombia by 2030, to be carbon neutral by 2050, to develop a very interesting revolution on energy. You have seen that Colombia has moved from 40 megawatts to at least 2,500 megawatts this year, from 2018 to 2022. So that means that today, for this year, at least 14% of the production of energy in Colombia is going to be on non-conventional renewable energy. We are also, or we developed the first policy on circular economy in Colombia. But of course, we know that for that, we need billions of dollars. So we're thinking that we need at least $40 billion in the next eight years. So that means uh, around five or, or even, even more, five, five, five thousand five hundred million dollars per year. So what, what are we doing now to actually collect that amount of money? We're developing new um, tools to do that. Let me give you two examples. One, the green bonds. We have actually issued the first green bonds on local markets in Colombia of around uh, $400 million. We are going to issue again those green bonds this year. Um, they have shown actually that they are actually real greenings in, in the market. We have also developed last week, and we launched it in New York, the green taxonomy. The green taxonomy is a way to see which assets and which projects are actually truly green to avoid this idea of greenwashing. I think that Using that, we have an opportunity, not only for the public sector, but also for the private sector. So we are developing all the tools, all the instruments to actually have enough resources to fund those uh, goals, which, as I said, they are ambitious. And, and, and we know that they are ambitious, but as a country, which is the second most biodiverse country in the world, well, we have a commitment on this issue. And finally, we have an opportunity based on the opportunity for growing more in the next years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thanks, Deborah and Jean, for those questions. Uh, let me, before turning over to Josh to close, let me just pick up on, on that. And, and Mr., you mentioned beforehand um, innovation, entrepreneurship, and the, and the many opportunities in Colombia's uh, 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 exceeding expectations and, and, the, and, and, and the role of the United States in helping to support that. How do you see, uh, of course, venture capital is critical uh, to that innovation and, and entrepreneurship. What do you see as, as policies that, that could be put in place to further, even further stimulate venture capital into Colombia, uh, whether it's in the green space or whether it's in innovation, entrepreneurship, and, and what could be the role of the United States and being a partner with Colombia in that regard? In my opinion, uh, and let me talk about, uh, in general, about entrepreneurship. 
I, I had the chance to work on that topic, being the Minister of Industry, Trade and Tourism. Uh, and I think that we have to work in different tracks. One track, how to develop the idea of, uh, or, or the culture of entrepreneurship. And that means that we have to work together different institutions. Again, academia, public sector, private sector, to build the culture of entrepreneurship, especially in our youngsters. Second, we need to work in the ecosystem, how to maybe strengthen the, uh, strengthen the ecosystem of entrepreneurship in Colombia, how to connect uh, the funding, the technical issues with actually the potential entrepreneurs. By developing actions like the ones that we have developed, the called C uh, Emprende, which is a, a kind of a, a model uh, similar to the ones that you have, for example, in, in Los Angeles. You have uh, strong uh, ecosystems over there, which we can learn from. We also need mentorship. And, and we can build programs of, of mentorship between or among the United States and Colombia. And of course, we need funding. And to do that, we actually need to develop these uh, uh, private capital funds and venture funds in, in Colombia. We need more uh, venture funds in Colombia, and we are and we are able and we can we could be able to actually uh, update the regulation that we need for that. So I think that if we work on those four tracks, we yeah. have opportunities. That, that that sounds excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you, uh, the, that answer. Uh, let me now turn over to uh, Josh Lipsky, uh, Senior Director of our Geoeconomic Center, uh, to uh, close this conversation. Josh? Jason, thank you. And thank you and the Adrian Arch Latin America Center for your collaboration throughout IMF World Bank Week on these events, and also just throughout the year, all the great work we do together. It's such a pleasure to work together. Minister, thank you. Thank you for coming here this morning. We know how busy this week is with the IMF World Bank meetings. We appreciate hearing from you, your energy, your vision for the country, and also for the reform global economic order. You talked about a reform Bretton Woods system that Kristalina Gorgieva, the head of the IMF, IMF has talked about last week, Secretary Yellen came to the Atlantic Council and talked about a reform Brentwood system. And I believe it's working with you, Colombia, other countries to think through what that looks like, that we will really achieve this vision. We are committed to doing that at the Atlantic Council. We hope to continue to work with you in the days ahead. So thank you for your time. Thank you everyone for being here this morning. We hope everyone has a good rest of the day. Thank you very much.